today we're going to be talking about one shots uh something i'm pretty excited about love to do uh uh, uh one shots with 5e and i'll be discussing some of the um kind of rules related to that specifically uh but uh, but also a lot of what i'll be covering will be good for other tabletop role-playing games talking about timing and one shots plot and one shot characters and one shots that's kind of transferable across across uh across games there um not certain that in live on stream we'll get the chat back today so uh we've just got the chat in uh in the replay unfortunately if you're watching this later on youtube you won't see the chat that's uh that's uh something you missed out on by not being here live on uh twitch um of course i can still see who's chatting it just won't be recorded on the on the uh the video interface there of the server for next time yeah so uh, if uh you're tuning in for the first time welcome to session prep i'm your game master gm ben i have my uh, mascot with me over at the far side not the twitch logo the d20 mimic backo and i'm here to help prepare your next session and the topic we'll be dealing with i have three headers this side three headers one shots we'll be talking about um and of course if you're watching on twitch feel free to uh, ask questions in the chat uh i'll read those aloud uh as i, as I touch on them and cover them there'll be time at the um kind of end uh, to just take questions in any direction any kind of dealing advice you want uh but as we're going along talking about one shots just jump in with any of your input or uh ideas or questions about a uh, one shot topic and uh we'll uh, I'll engage with those as we go through it um and uh, as usual if you are watching uh on, on twitch uh, be sure to follow if you're watching on youtube be sure to like and subscribe uh the Goodman games channel of course appreciates this support so do i i'm on uh twitter and youtube at gm ben and i'm on uh, tiktok and twitch at gm ben show you can see down here um yeah, so that covers the kind of opening stuff. Uh, rush through it all and hit the high points. Um, but uh, yeah, and I apologize again that we don't have the, the, the chat and stream, but I won't mess with it while we're live. Instead, let's get right to one shots. Uh, running a one shot, a one nighter, a convention game, a special occasion game. Uh, like I like to do our last our last topic that 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 video is uh, will be up on YouTube shortly, if not already. Uh, last our last topic two weeks ago was uh, horror games. I like to do horror one shots. They're they're a great opportunity uh, to kind of do something a little different. Uh, you don't necessarily want to do horror in an ongoing game always, but in a one shot it fits so well. Um, I've done birthday one shots just to do something out of the ordinary. Um, I've done a few convention games, but that's not my specialty. Um, I really like one shots for uh, people I know for special occasions. Um, I wanted to ask chat, and I can brainstorm a little bit as well here uh why are one shots better what do they do better uh that might be our starting point if we know or have an idea or uh, premise of why one shots are better it can help us kind of uh lean into those strengths uh use some of those to build the best one shots we can uh yeah <laughs> jack jack shanks they end uh go see squid oh players feel like we can take risks. i love both of those I love both those um yeah, one shots uh, are bookended, right? They have uh, they all they, they begin when we all gather, and they they end in the same night. So many campaigns don't get that nice, satisfying, like big climactic battle that leads to a conclusion. They kind of fizzle out. So a uh, one shot uh, is a great opportunity for that. You can also say if uh, some of this advice will apply not just to one shots, but to say like a mini series. Uh, don't forget that between an ongoing campaign and one shots, which are one night, you could plan you know a three night game or a two-night game, or a five-night game, a limited-run storyline. Uh, those, I think, are underappreciated, but uh, we'll save that topic for another time. The one-shot, they end. Um, one-shots are... Uh, uh, book-ended in the plot. They've got a beginning and ending. Three years doing Tyranny of Dragons, yeah, I believe it. I did uh, just Horde of the Dragon Queen, and it was a year and a half, uh, and that was just a level eight, which is, like, so much faster than the later stuff. Three years, absolutely believe it. Um, go see Squidos as players. They can feel like they can take risks. I like that one as well. I like it a lot. Uh, if you've got uh, an ongoing storyline, um, uh, oh, I forgot that I can bring back a little bit of music while we're sitting here and just chatting. Um, not too much. Uh, if you've got a little bit of a storyline, uh, going on, 
players are sometimes get um and i've, I've experienced this as a player um your actions have consequences right uh, and the consequences can be as simple as um uh if you're um if you're in a comedy genre your joke alienated or pushed away the npc that was supposed to be crucial to your party if you're in a uh if you're in a horror genre um and you're playing long term you want that character to survive dw gable welcome you want if you're in a horror genre you want that character to survive for many sessions in a row um you're kind of timid of those risks you're not going to be as funny in character because you realize that what your character does and says will come back to haunt them uh if you're playing horror you're going to want you're going to focus on the surviving rather than the taking risks you're not going to be the daring character when the chips are down um in one shots yeah players uh they're kind of aware if i perish and it's all worth it i only have to sit out you know one hour of the rest of the night it's not as big of a deal and players will take risks i love that one more readily yeah um and uh i'm not gonna try and read uh your full name but uh bahasal says um one shots are also good if you want to play a game but you have a busy schedule and can commit time yeah i like that as well where uh you kind of reach out to people and you say oh uh, you know in the first week of may i'm gonna do one shot on the saturday who's available and some people you know who have otherwise busy schedules can't commit to weekly can't commit to bi-weekly but they say you know what uh, i'm gonna shift things around i want to come just for that first saturday in may or whatever's going on uh i've got a few one shots that i'm thinking of doing i'm gonna have um family visiting uh next month and i want to run a one shot for one of my family members uh and bring in some friends and so uh this is why i've got one shots on the mind um and goes to squids as players can test drive a system yeah and i think one shots are this may be outside of what i'll talk on too much today but yeah, Ghosty, Ghosty Squiddo is absolutely right. One shots are great for um, trying out a new rule system before you've started a full campaign, or trying out a new group for that matter. If you uh, don't play with the re regular people, but you're kind of meeting new people, if you're a dungeon master, uh, as many of the people tuning to the stream are, and you uh, you've got um, uh, you're planning to run for a new group or you're hoping to run for a new group it's great to run a one shot first get to know them decide if that's a group you want to design a whole year's worth of content for uh I'll add that as well test a new system or group test new players uh i did that for a while when i was i'm um, hoping to run a long-term game i thought oh, i'll just run a few short adventures get to know the people get to know their players uh, figure out who meshes and and who would be best for kind of a, joining in a long-term higher level game once you know people's styles and if they they match your your gaming style your gaming style um shout out to those players who may be tuning in to watch because they made it into that long-term campaign we played three we started with some um one-shot style adventures and we ended up playing three years when the pandemic came made it all the way to level 20. uh a, a highlight of those years for me for sure um so we have some examples of why one shots are are better um uh but setting them up can be a little different there can be different things about them and i think uh i want to start with the the characters uh start with uh it's not always where you might start when you're brainstorming but uh we've talked a little bit about the players can take risks and you can plus uh, test drive new a new system um so I was thinking of approaching the one shot the same way uh, your players would see it. They'd see it characters first. They'd see it the heroes first. Uh, what can we, anyone who's uh, run one shots and has different one shot ideas, uh, what can we do differently with the characters in a one shot? Let's say you're doing fifth edition um, and you want to try something a little different. What can you do with the characters? I'm going to put some of our, our notes here up on the uh, the table. I find with characters, the default is to go pre-made, right? You've got a one-shot, you've got one night only, you've got three hours, you've got six hours if you're lucky, maybe you've got a whole day, but you've, you've got a tight plot. So the default is pre-made. 
And I would say... It's a great choice. It works well. There's lots of resources online of, of, of pre-existing characters. So you can pull them out and just say, oh, here's a group of, you know, third level... Here's a third level party that you can uh, you can be from. Anyone can be any of these. Uh, this fighter, this cleric, etc. Um, I find pre-made... One, they won't match the adventure as well. Pre-made ends up kind of generic. I once tried to do a uh, one-shot, and I wanted the characters, the pre-made characters, to be intermeshed, as I'd done several times before. So I started making all the characters to match up with what the plot was going to be. I think the plot was going to be... It was a horror one-shot. There was a, a, a witch uh, that had been a midwife in the village before the village turned against her. And so I wanted the midwife, a.k.a. witch, aka maybe she's innocent to be connected to the characters backstories and i was you know one of them was birthed by her one of them is her family member and i was trying to write up these characters and it ate up so much of my time pre-making like six seven pre-made characters that had this kind of storyline connected to the plot that i ended up uh that one was not ready for halloween and i think i never ran that in the long run so uh if you use generic pre-made characters they are a little too bland they're just like uh, simple action heroes if you want to make them custom to your adventure i think that can be excellent uh, you can say, who wants to play, um, uh, the, who wants to play the ranger who fled the town long ago and has never returned? Who wants to play the wizard who is the wise man for the town? And so you can set up this, uh, this interconnected, uh, element, uh, of the characters, but that is so much effort. I caution Dungeon Masters against doing it. Uh, it even derailed one of my games once. Um... Uh, Ghosty Squiddo says, so do you prefer to gear pregens to match up with the story? I love when pregens match up with the story. I think it's so much, so much uh, stronger. So one of the things that I've been leading towards is uh, let the players make characters for a one shot. This comes with a word of caution, though, because it has its own pitfalls. Uh, make characters like pre-made can be too generic. G N E R I. Pre made can be too generic. Pre made can be time consuming. If it's not generic, uh, in your prep time, uh, let the players make characters. I think the one downside there is it's time consuming at the session. Uh, and this is in prep. And this is time consuming. But I think it's worth it. Um, I think setting aside that hour uh, as everyone gathers, if you're doing a lengthier one shot, to do a little bit, at least let them make half the characters. Like, for example, you hand them a generic warrior, you're a warrior, now we're going to do something um, a little different to modify that warrior, make it your own. Or uh, something I like to do that I might dive into, I might dive into a bit more in this one shot, is I like to do a commoner's one shot, where everyone is playing as the weakest heroes possible. Um, and then it's much simpler to make characters. It's pared down. There's a, we're still using the 5e 5th edition chassis, um, but essentially no class abilities. Uh, it's possible to make characters in a more all while gathering in that time frame. Um, one of the advantages of letting the players make uh, their characters while gathered is you can do some um, you can do some different things. Uh, I guess you could do it with premium as well. I should say it's um, I guess it could be an advantage for either system. So I, sh I guess I should say while we're thinking about characters. Um, one of the advantages to one shots is that you can really change up on the characters in different ways that you wouldn't normally in an ongoing campaign. Like I would, I would strongly encourage Dungeon Masters that are playing to run a longer campaign to, especially the new Dungeon Masters, to stick to rules as written for the characters, you know, play the classes as they're, as they're there. Um, be cautious of experimenting with homebrew or dramatic changes to the classes. But right up there with testing a new system, which is one of the things you can do with a, with a one-shot, uh, when it comes to the characters, you can also uh, test some new character concepts. And that allows you to let the people, let your players play something unusual. Um, I'll just draw a line across here. What are the things we can do with characters? We can uh, play unusual characters. Play unusual characters. I once ran a one shot and uh, I was letting them pre make characters in advance. So the players were making the characters, but they were kind of like messaging me where it was going to be a, a lengthy, kind of like a full day one shot. And everyone was making their characters beforehand, messaging me about it. And one, uh, this is third edition, I believe, on uh, pre Pathfinder. And one of the players said, uh, instead of a uh, 
a necromancer, can I play as a horse that is actually the necromancer and the skeleton riding me that everyone thinks is a necromancer is my minion? And uh, I just absolutely love that. I said, let's find a way to do it. You are not the skeleton. You are the horse. And we were going in a dungeon, so I was like, are you okay with being a pony and the skeleton is a halfling? And everyone thought the silent, like, skeletal pointing figure on the horse was the necromancer, and uh, and she was narrating it in that, in that style. But when the skeleton got just absolutely obliterated by a trap, everyone was surprised when the pony kept adventuring with them, casting spells. It was, it was a great little twist that, that character had in mind. So you've got room for unusual characters. Uh, in that instance, the, the player came to me with the, the question they wanted to play the unusual character. But you can, um, you can also think up unusual characters to match your storyline. And that's um, one of the examples that I, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, I like one-shots with weaker characters. Uh, the, like commoners, so to speak. Which was a style I picked up because of the commoners rules in the 3rd edition Dungeon Master's Guide way back 20 years ago. Um, D&D... Uh, this is all an A. D and D uh, regularly does powerful characters. It's great at giving your group these abilities that allow them to absolutely rain down fire and fury on their enemies. All they need to do is just slightly out level a threat, kind of come back to them. But um, because we get that experience so much in the generic uh, standard uh, rules of Dungeons and Dragons, a one shot is a great opportunity uh, to take away some of those powers and run weaker characters that have to, uh, they can't just rely on the abilities on their sheet. They can't just uh, uh, cast Fireball. Uh, if they want to detonate something, they've got to go find oil. Weaker characters kind of um, mean that you, the solutions to problems don't come from uh, your abilities, they come from problem solving. And so weaker characters sends you in a direction of engaging with the lore, the world, the story more, which I think befits a one-shot in a nice way, uh, where you can have a more immersive world and let the players uh, have to use that be, but because they don't have the powers available to them. Uh, an example of, of this, um, I'll put it up on my uh, uh, board here. An example of commoners uh, is you can just do, you know, they all have a d6 hit die, uh, proficiency in two skills, and a background. That can be all that you give them to start with. And it can be enough that they're all a little different. They've each picked a background, which gives them a little equipment list. They've all got a very low number of hit points, which makes them afraid of the threat. It's great for horror. It's great for um, grittiness. It's great for problem solving. And then uh, every character, in addition to the background, has those two skills that they uh, they have available to them. And it's their only problem solving technique is what, okay, all right, I'm proficient in acrobatics. I'm proficient in sleight of hand. Uh, okay, I'm proficient in um, uh, maybe two different ones, arcana and athletics. That's your, uh, all you've got, your only strength. Other than that, you've got your own problem solving. And um, when I say weaker characters, I also, I think of one of the fun advantages of a one-shot is you can play with characters that are a bit more random. Um, uh, when I say random, I say uh, decided by dice. The truest definition of random, not random as in they act random, but it built randomly. You know, if you, uh, for one-shots, I like to use, I'll put this here on the, uh, the left-hand side as well. Um, if you're, uh, open to weaker characters, you're open for random characters, one of the things I've done with one-shots, which I would recommend everyone try if they've never done it before, is your character is 3d6 stats down the line, right? You roll your 3d6. Five, five, six. Oh well, man, our character's starting off strong already. But you don't even get to choose where it goes. So you've got this 16 to start. You've got a 16 in strength. Keep going down the line. You've got a 5 in dexterity. That's the character you're playing tonight in the one shot. Uh, this is one of the reasons I like to make characters together. We kind of gather. It's one of the things we've done. I like to try different options. But this is a popular one that I keep going back to. Uh, we gather. We've got that spare hour. People are chatting, getting into uh, catching up after the week. 
um talking about whatever holidays uh, we're, we're playing during and uh and at the same time rolling up stats and you just roll a 16 strength and a five dexterity five dexterity you can't even get a five dexterity by standard rules so now you're playing a character that uh will absolutely uh be unable to balance on anything uh he's probably going to get hit by every attack but he's going to uh, 16 strength being very tough for a 3 6 array is absolutely going to uh, lay down the hurt when needed. Um, love how that character shaping up. Um, so, one shots, when we're talking about taking risks in the plot, it can also be about taking risks in uh, the character build and making weaker commoners, uh, making characters 3d6 stats kind of play right into that. Uh, something that one shots are great for. Um, When I also was saying unusual, I wanted to ask if anyone had any suggestions or ideas. Uh, what one-shots have you done or would you like to do? What other kinds of unusual characters could there be that are worth playing in one-shots um, that you wouldn't get to make or create or be or play with the standard 5th edition rule set, but that in a one-shot it makes sense that you could play them? We can come back to this as well when we uh, talk about some of the different plots. We can think about what sorts of unusual characters can be there. Um, unusual personalities, always keep it interesting. Yeah, that's what AO suggests, unusual personalities. Right in line with um, uh, characters randomly decided by dice. I, uh, I encourage in one-shots, um, in long-term campaigns, I encourage my players not to roll their personality traits, bonds, and flaws, but to choose them to pick the type of character they want to play. In short-term one-shots, I absolutely encourage roll your personality traits, roll your flaws, see what you get. Um, I recently did a one shot where I googled online to just look quickly for kind of wacky or fun personality traits and flaws, grabbed that list, threw it in, made it available to the team, and uh, that's what everyone had to use. And we ended up with some absolutely memorable characters like uh, there was a character who, uh, credit to the website that I got this from, I don't remember, but uh, there's a character who thought they were a loaf of bread that uh, was animating uh, their self. Um, there was a character in a very rural sense who thought that cow patties were the, sol the uh, solution to all that ails you in life and kind of an engineering personality that could um, engineer any success out of cow muck. Uh, those were not, no credit to me, they found them on a random list of fun traits or flaws for characters. And they just, uh, we were playing a comedy style genre and they brought some uh, some jokes to the table right, right out of the gate. Um, Another unusual characters that's common in one shot. Some people have used fifth edition rules to do modern day, and uh, uh, Ao says a bunch of weirdos trapped together during Breakfast Club detention. I mean, in a haunted house, surrounded by zombies. Yeah, uh, I was just just thinking very similar that a lot of people have used DD rules to do a modern day, and in not commoners, but to basically play yourselves or to play modern day teens or to play uh, everyday folk uh, in the 21st century. And that's a sort of unusual character is that you can then use the D&D rules to try and solve the problems of the haunted house, of the zombies. Um, all excellent things to run uh, for a one-shot. Something um, else that I'll add is when you're when you're playing a one shot, you have to compress some info. You've got to bring it together really quickly. You've got to bring the table together. Uh, and so when I'm thinking about making characters at the table, or uh, if people have made them in advance, or they've got generic characters, you, if you even if you've got those generic characters, uh, you want to do something to give a little customization, a little twist at the table when everyone's gathered. And I'll share with you all a, uh, I'll share with you all a little, um, connecting characters mini game that I've done. Um, I sometimes will say, I'll, I'll take a deck of cards and I'll assemble, uh, the hearts and diamonds, uh, in one, uh, deck. And if they're, let's say I've got six players, so I'll take the three, four, and five, and I'll do similarly with the spades and clubs. And uh, if I'll deal them out and I'll say uh, you all got a red card and you all got a black card, either a heart and diamond or a spade and club. 
the character who you share a red number with, i.e. three of hearts and three of diamonds, you have a positive connection with. And the character you share the black uh, card with, either hearts and spades, you uh, like the three of heart and three of spades, you have a negative connection with them. And so starting right out, when we're doing character introductions, um, when we're doing uh, describe your character, you know, how did you arrive here at the haunted house? Uh, I played this little mini game and uh, at the same time as you're describing your character, tell me now uh, what is that positive connection you share with the character with the uh, that you drew the both drew the heart uh, the three of hearts the three of diamonds what is the what is the negative connection and we got some you know there was a hermit and a criminal and we got some uh funny uh, it was a horror game but we got some funny moments that someone was mad at the uh, hermit for sleeping on their lawn and uh someone else uh, the positive connection was that they um uh, I can't remember one of the one of the one of the strong ones, but like positive connections, like they both already know that they are uh, looking for lore in this haunted mansion, and the 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 hermit and the criminal together. The criminal wants to steal book, and the hermit wants the lore, and they've already figured out they can work together. So this sort of stuff, uh, sometimes in a longer campaign, it will come up kind of generically as we see the positive negative relationships that develop between characters. A bit of role playing, but uh, in a one shot, you got to compress that. And a little game. Uh, that deals out red cards and black cards. Um, and then you have a connection with the matching number is a great way to quickly speed together and set up dynamics. So then you have this moment where, it, you know, you, there's a negative connection between the two characters that drew the, the three of spades and the three of clubs. And one of them is dying on the floor on the second story of the mansion. And the other one who's mad at the hermit for sleeping on their lawn sometimes runs up there and bandages their wounds and it's just a more dynamic moment when it's out of that negative connection that the character says i'll still help you and runs up there and helps it, it creates richer richer uh character dynamics in a one shot um Yeah, so as I was saying, you do like a po one, one, one positive connection, one negative connection each uh, per character member drawing with the red and black cards. It's a neat little mini game you can do. Yeah, and if, exactly. It says you have uh, four players, you just take out some cards. I can say uh, if you have an odd number of players, you either need to be very careful how you deal it, or you can end up with two characters having a... Um, uh, you can end up with a little circle where like three characters or some of them have a positive connection with themselves and then one person is missing out. Uh, if you have an odd number of characters, so you have to be cautious of that. But as a DM, uh, you could just look at the cards as you're dealing them and say, mm, oh wait, I can't give you that because uh, I've already, uh, these, you know, there is no one else left with that number. Or you can have a three, uh, 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 pardon the expression, a three-way positive or negative connection as well. Um, throw in the Joker for a wild card. Yeah, why not? If you would not ever throw in the Joker, say describe, you pick any type of a random uh, connection uh, and and I I've found players respond quite nicely to this little moment they get a prompted narrative positive connection negative connection they get to take that moment to describe something so I wanted to share that it's a way that even if you do generic pre-made characters you can draw out a lot more description you can get the players thinking about the uh how their character inhabits this world that you're playing instead of just a bunch of stats on a character sheet right away you're playing a little mini game uh, interacting connecting the party um something else that i like to do uh is give every character a hook or connection to the adventure this is really crucial this is a great segue into premises and plots um, because you, in a one shot, we've already, especially if we've already spent an hour making characters on the same night that we plan to play, you've got to get them, uh, without railroading them, you've got to get them on a fast track to solving this adventure, to solving this quest. And, uh, one of the ways to do that is to give every character a unique connection or hook to the adventure. And I've, I've even used them as victory points to say that, uh, oh, if you find the book in the mansion, you get a special victory point. And, oh, if you um are able to find the deed and put your name on it so you become the rightful owner of the haunted house you will get a victory point uh each of them with a unique hook or connection um to think of some more examples of these i want to throw it to chat uh as we as we transition to um plots of one shots one shot plots 
what are some premises of one shots that you have run or that you wish you could play in or that you have played in um we've talked about the haunted house we've talked about uh zombies in the modern day uh we've talked about commoner characters what are maybe expanding on those or what are some one-shot premises that uh they, those of you in the chat have in mind and i can i can add to some as well um Just putting on the board here that you can connect characters. You can connect characters to each other. And you can also connect characters to the plot. Yeah, Ghosty Squid says the lost or ancient temple trope. Uh, yeah, that's an excellent one. Uh, a little bit Indiana Jones. Uh... A little bit Tomb Raider. That's a great trope because we've regularly played the 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 ongoing storyline of the Lost Temple. But when we do that, we almost have this premise that well, my character is a hero. You know, I made them to survive. They're gonna come out of this alive. They're gonna go on to multiple adventures after this one. But uh, Ghosty Squid uh, uh, brings up the Lost Ancient Temple um, trope for a one shot, and I think that's a great one because it's the element of danger is so much higher when your temple is a one shot. The players now know. This trap could be my last. This dungeon room could be my last. There is no social contract that my character is likely to survive this. Danger can be turned up to 11 uh, in a one shot. Take risks, as we say uh, when we were brainstorming them. Yeah, the lost temple trope. I'll use lost temple trope uh, as an example. Um... Using Lost Temple Trope as an example, thinking of some, uh, to give every character a hook or connection. My goodness, this one's excellent. Uh, what I would do if I were going to run the Last Temple Trope, I would get some blank cue cards, uh, one per character, and I'd write on them uh, a unique hook or connection to the adventure, shuffle them up, deal them out. I would put such things as uh, your character uh, has a map uh, of half the temple, let's say. Don't do the whole thing. <laughs> half the temple you may then have to print that map out and share it with them but no problem a character has a map to half the temple um a character uh knows uh knows the location of a hidden chamber uh why why for each of these I'm running off the page there knows the has a map to half of the temple knows location of a hidden chamber these are neat because you've given them a little hook a little uh little rules benefit but at the same time uh, it's going to be more to that why do they have half the temple well uh your mentor gave it to you as his uh as he was training you he handed you the map um why do you know the location of a hidden chamber um you had a dream uh you lost your uh, parent uh to this very temple and you had a dream of where they perished and it is in a hidden room and you're confident that you can find it here um oh what's another one uh oh uh, one shots are great something we didn't touch on one shots are great to kind of just in a small way pit the characters against each other a little competitive you don't want uh, anyone backstabbing one another until the final scene but uh, with that in mind, maybe characters backstab each other in the final scene strikes can be something that fits in a one shot if your group's open to that. Um, so you could say um, one character is uh, secretly a member of the temple cult. And they're tasked with bringing new heroes into the temple to perish. To feed, uh, you know, in a kind of Tomb of Horrors Acerac style, to feed some sort of soulmonger. Uh, we can just borrow that or something similar, a blood sacrifice. They're they're secretly a member of the cult, um, and their job is to bring other heroes there. Uh, each of these could have a little victory point if you want to play a neat little mini game. Um, you have a map of half the temple. Your mentor wants you to map out the other half. Uh, you want to find your uh, deceased relative's uh, remains and put them to rest where they perished in the hidden room. Uh, the cult wants to lead everyone 
to the sacrificial chamber, which is the ultimate or penultimate chamber of the uh, second last last or second last chamber of the dungeon inn. All three of these are leading your characters. Oh, you need the other half of the temple map. Well, you have to go to the final chamber. Uh, the dream knows the hidden location. Where is that? It's the final chamber. Uh, the cult want the cult secret cult member wants the team to be sacrificed. Uh, where? In the secret chamber. Uh, so you've got these three hooks that is leading all the players to your final conclusion, which is uh, a great thing to do uh, in your uh, the plot for your one shot. Uh, because a uh, little segue, um, one shot plots need to be tight. They need to be trim. Um, I'll, uh, before I switch into that, I just wanted to ask if anyone else in the chat had another one-shot premise. Uh, otherwise, I can move on to looking at how we can do a one-shot plot. And maybe we'll use this Lost Temple trope as an example. Lost Temple is an excellent one to work with to brainstorm and consider how the kind of how the plot in one shots need to be really really short. So we've got a Lost Temple. Write that up here. Thank you for that suggestion, Ghosty Squid. Uh, we've got a lost temple. So one of the, one of the plot problems that DMs often run into with one shots is they design an adventure that is too big. Um, you know, you've got to go and collect three stones to open the final door. Uh, the party has found two of the stones and it's already midnight and it's, according to the, the legend, they need the third stone and how are you going to, what are you going to do? It's in a room that they haven't even gotten to yet. Um, or I've done this as well, where one of my one shots that ended up going till two in the morning when it, that was unintentional years ago. And I, I learned it's important to have this kind of shorter, shorter timeline is, uh, the characters were shipwrecked on an, in an aisle and the only way out was to... Uh, I'll Dr. Moreau style um, confront the kind of experimenting like arch alchemist that had has a manor on the aisle and all sorts of monstrosities and um, uh, it was midnight and they just entered the building and they uh, needed to get to the either the chamber with the um, the boats in the back or the chamber with the airship in the top and uh, well I gave them two options but when it was you know we're nearing the end time they've only just entered the building uh, I, you know I messed up I by not thinking in advance the way we're about to do right now with this Lost Temple. So one-shot plots need to be uh, very trim. You've got to have room for them in a single night. Uh, if there's an overflow you have to play again, well, to everyone's benefit. It's nice to play a second time, but if that's not what you're trying to do, it's uh, not ideal. Um, they need a very trim uh, beginning middle and end now every adventure has this but some of them don't have it in foresight some of them only develop the middle and the as, as we see how it plays out with the players uh i think with a one shot it's crucial to think and it's crucial to use times you know if you're going to be if you're going to be beginning at six you meet at 6 p.m last one shot i thought did that was our timeline we're meeting at 6 p.m um so we're going to make characters so we're going to be starting by 7 p.m and then in the middle uh, oh, and I, we knew we were going to aim to end by 11 p.m. Um, there's some overflow there. Like that way, if we aim for 11, um, some people are willing to stay up a little later and push past if we're going a little later. So that puts our middles at 9 p.m., right? R I wrote these times down before we got started. Uh, Ghost, uh, Ghosty Squiddo says you can find the bodies of the first set of PCs. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. 
I, I forget what you were um, uh, responding to with that with that uh, idea, but that's a rich one for the temple as well. That uh, that should be our beginning. I'm just going to steal that. Uh, whatever your suggestion for that was, our, bit, our beginning is going to be they find the other bodies. They literally trap one has already been sprung. Um, so it helps to know where you're going to begin. And, uh, and the beginning should set up the premise, right? Uh, we can start, uh, in, in media res, uh, like you can start with the first room of the dungeon, should you so choose. You all stand in the first room of this terrible temple, having been drawn to it by, uh, oh, that member over there, that party member over there knew the way because of their map, or that party over there knew the way because they, uh, they seemed to have been here before, but they did not reveal why, and that's secretly the cult member. Um, but you're, you're beginning, you're 7 p.m., we're, we're ready to roll dice, you've already made characters. It kind of established the premise a little bit. We shouldn't... The beginning should tell you where it's going to end, right? Like a nice little arc. You should see from beginning from the beginning, you should, especially in a one-shot one night, you should see the end. Self Goodman says, we're going to Strad's Castle, whether you're ready or not. Uh, absolutely, right from the outset, if you're playing Strad's Castle as a, uh, if you're playing uh, Ravenloft as a one-shot, of course, it's a lengthier, you can't just do it in one night, but maybe a one-shot, like a one weekend, as I've done, uh, or a one long day, kind of a, tr a trim one. You say, uh, um, the midpoint of, of the Castle Ravenloft adventure, hopefully this is not a spoiler to anyone who hasn't played it, but essentially around the midpoint uh, towards the end, the rising action, you're going to Strad's Castle for the last time because you're going to confront Strad, and then, of course, entering the castle is a quite a climactic uh whole arc once you're in there but um but uh uh if you're dming castle ravenloft you can say to your party to your players this uh, i have to be honest with you you know we're trying to do this in one 12 hour session um so you have until 6 p you know we're starting at noon we're playing till midnight uh you have until 6 p.m to kind of uh try and solve some of the uh, issues out here but at six, we you're going Castle Ravenloft, whether whether you are ready or not. You're going to Strad's Castle, uh, and we shall see. And that can be a little bit heavy-handed, but in a one-shot, your players are more likely to accept that uh, if they they want more agency if they're playing a long-term campaign. But in a one-shot, they're more uh, open to that kind of oh, let's let's do this adventure because we're all here for one night to try and do it, and it'd be a shame if we didn't make it to Strad's Castle. Um, so uh, our middle should be a i picture this is there's no hard rule here but uh the example i just gave and going to strides castle at the middle and um and i picture the, the middle should be a transition or a shift often uh transition or twist um it should feel like a midpoint uh because you are now on the way towards the ending uh and you know you don't want everything every detail spelled out in the beginning so think about what what is going to be revealed at the middle. And so, for example, in Castle Ravenloft, this is a smidge, smidge of a spoiler. Spoiler alert, mute this if you haven't played it. Um, but just as you arrive in Castle Ravenloft, uh, there's this twist where you were actually going to talk to Strahd before you confront him. And uh, there's this the, this great moment that you, you're wondering, is this the end where we, you maybe don't even have what you need to face him? You need to plumb the depths of the castle. And then you find out he's kind of playing with you like a cat with mice. And that's the twist. It's like he knows we're entering the castle and he lets us go exploring while he continues to toy with us. Uh, it's this great kind of fulcrum point where you uh, you think you're on the way to the end, but it got worse. The twist, the transition uh, come up at the middle. And you got to try to get to that by 9 p.m. So we're in a lost temple. Uh, we found the other we found the other party's bodies, which tells us the premise, tells us how dangerous it is. Um, one of the other party members, maybe maybe they, if you didn't use a map as a character connection, maybe one of them has the half map. Uh, one of them could have a puzzle hint, could have a magic item that's necessary. And they could, this opening premise, plus the character cards, could point you that the ending of the temple is going to be the lost artifact, the MacGuffin, um, the chalice, the the final chamber something there you've seen it in advance the transition tells us it's shifting so uh let's say you find out uh find out the temple is actually in use there's a a live cult involved uh in what's happening it is uh currently around the midpoint is where you're going to uncover that 
um, there is actually a ceremony. When you go to the end chamber, which you thought you were headed towards, it is not going to be simply a uh, a, conclu a, a dusty old trap-laden room. Uh, it is actually going to be an active cult ceremony, which is a neat twist because people going into a lost temple may think that there's going to be predominantly um, uh, trap finding, uh, monster battling, and then there's you realize now, well, here's an opportunity for stealth. Here's an opportunity for um, uh, negotiation because we can pretend to be cultists as we sneak into this cult chamber. Um... Uh, Ao says there's new letters on the temple table. Turns out they've been paying their recent tax. They uh, turns out they've been paying their recent tax bills. Yeah, so the temple's <laughs> the temple's an <laughs> active taxpayer in the kingdom. Uh, you know, uh, Al Capone was caught for tax fraud, so the the evilest people in the world pay their dues to the king, lest they draw uh, the monarch's ire. Um, so you need this kind of tight um timeline beginning middle and end we're not quite to the end but the reason why i have a little segue here is as i would say you know use a clock for this especially for a one shot you actually need a clock you almost you set a little alarm kind of quietly in your pocket or something um because if you want to end at 11 you know that means you need to the the, the climactic scene needs to probably start at 10 p.m or 10 30 if you've got some overflow time so you've kind of got this like halfway between the middle at the end you got this clock 10 p.m that's when you should be on the way to the 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 climactic end scene and of course the end scene is going to be that sacrificial chamber we were thinking of and then an, a good end scene uh brings it all together everything that uh was on the character connection cards um, everything the players have learned all along, every magic item and boon brings it all together uh, in that final conclusion. And with the one shot, it's so trim and tight that there's not uh, there's not a lot of like. Let me give you an example here. So, for example, um, I often give out use the trinkets, the player's handbook. When you're playing a one shot, here's a trinket, and the trinket is there. If you're low powered characters, the trinket there is a tool. It's like it's it's in your sandbox to use to lean on. To you can trade it. You're like, oh, I've got this magic musical box that never runs out of that never needs to be wound or i've got this marble that always points upward it's kind of strange and you can trade it with someone so it's a little tool to use or to have but in one shots because we roll the triggers randomly i don't have time to connect them to the plot sometimes in long-term campaigns i'll actually once i find out a character's trinket i'll make a note of that and we can work it into the storyline but in a one shot i have not tended to do that and it's for shame a little bit because one of the great things about a one shot is you know uh, they find things on the bodies in the beginning, for example. They're like, oh, a sword, great. We were just playing commoners in this temple like fools. I'm Good thing I picked up the sword. Like maybe they were prisoners forced to go in by the king to collect the taxes or something, I don't know. So they go in without gear and they find gear. Uh, well, the gear is going to be helpful. Uh, if they find a healing potion, well, you can bet that's going to be helpful. But for example, don't put in um, a helmet of water breathing unless there's an underwater requirement. Likewise, if you know that there's a crucial um, scene that can be benefited or like uh, there's a great water chamber in the sacrificial, there's a great water section in the sacrificial chamber. And if they're smart enough to figure out that the helm that they find on the bodies of the beginning is a helm of water breathing, they can go underwater. And so your one shot, if you've, uh, if you've got the time to kind of link it all together, try and bring everything back into that conclusion. Like any magic items are going to be useful there. We see that a lot in movies. Everything a character picks up on along the way is finally going to help them on their journey towards or in that climactic scene. And if you can work that into your one shots, uh, it's, it's something we're all familiar with movies. It'll be quite, quite rewarding. Um, and uh, Ao says there may be wider implications. What if the players do kill all the cultists in the sacrificial chamber and they were tax playing citizens to the king after all? Uh, great, a great uh, twist, a great what if, uh, especially for a, if you're playing a comedy Lost Temple, a little thing to bring in. So, I say use a clock, but something else to use is, um, uh, think of optional scenes as well. Think of optional scenes. And there's, uh, the reason why this is useful, I gave the example earlier on about, um, my players needed to escape the island and they'd just gotten into the keep and, uh, it was midnight and they needed to confront the arch alchemist um, and get on the boat. Well, what I should have done is I should have said, um, if I'm running late on time, the alchemist will be in the front room to the keep, 
right? I can just trim the extra rooms. The alchemist will be in the keep. So think in advance. Uh, what scenes can you trim to save on time? What scenes, what encounters, uh, what rooms in the temple? Like a hallway could have a magical trap door. But you can say to yourself, nah, if it's already 10 p.m., I'm going to take that trap right out because we need to get to the climax. That's, uh, you know, you're, you're helping, like taking out the trap, right? Uh, we wouldn't, as dungeon masters, normally do that. Like, okay, the players took too long and I'm, ta and I'm making it easier for them by taking out a trap. We wouldn't normally do that. We'd say, oh, you took too long. Uh, you, you know, you took, you have to face this trap no matter what. But in a one shot, we want to get that really satisfying climactic finish. You don't want to be holding your players well past their bedtime if people are starting to get droopy and bail on you early. So think of what scenes can come out when you're behind on time. Uh, what scenes can be removed? And that's great because uh, ultimately you may find yourself removing the second to last scene. Like, okay, we're close to the end. Move the second to last scene, skip over, we arrive at the end. That's uh, unfortunate because that may be a strong scene. It may be something you really wanted to do. So if you've got your if you've got your session timed out, you think, okay, we're starting at 7 p.m., middle's at 9, you know roughly where you are on the time. You can actually, uh, I did this recently in a one-shot. Uh, if 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 my if we were able to start promptly, I had an extra little thing I was gonna do in the beginning, but I knew if we were already past 7 p.m. getting started, I was actually gonna cut that. So what I cut was something right right at the start uh, that I knew if we weren't on time, I took that out. And, and as a result, we had a prompt 11 p.m. finish. It was uh, uh, un unusual. <laughs> like I say 11, we have to go we have to go later when it gets to this. But you you know, if you aim for that, you'll hit it sometimes. Um, so think of the optional scenes. And uh, similarly, uh, I like what uh, Salt Goodman said earlier. We're going to Strad's Castle, whether you're ready or not. Although it would be better. It would be better if maybe the Dungeon Master there thought of like a plot reason of why you needed to go. So um, uh, I'm going to put this in a bigger note here. Um, have a hook to bring on the ending. So, for example, um, Strahd's Castle. Uh, you say to the players, at midnight, or not midnight, because you don't have to be sooner, um, at a certain time in the evening, when the full moon begins to rise, the everyone who's inflicted by lycanthropy in Strahd's Domain is going to turn into werewolves. And the woods and the towns and the roads are going to get extremely dangerous. And all that will be left that is safe, worst wor worst thing ever, Strides Castle is the only place that is safe from the werewolves. So essentially, you've uh, you've ratcheted up the danger at that moment if they tally and it's if they uh, dally. And it uh, it's a it's a message and a warning and it's a hook that it brings on. We better get to Strides Castle. So you get to the time that you've picked, say, you know, midway through your session. You want to go to the castle, you say the full moon begins to arrive. So key events in the adventure uh, to real world time, out of game time. Uh, ask Io, yes, absolutely. Key events in the adventure to the actual clock. And you can be transparent with your players, because it's a one shot, there's room for that. Or you can just kind of do it subtly. For example, uh, if they know, if they have learned that in the transition twist element, they've learned that they need to stop this in, in progress ceremony, then you can, uh, you can tell them they hear a gong. The, the ceremony is starting. Uh, so right at right at 10 p.m., you know, you look at your clock, you're, there's a beep in your pocket, you know the gong sounds out, the ceremony's starting. And even if you didn't reveal to the players that that was going to be happening at 10 p.m., uh, you can then, they kind of know with their victory conditions, with their quest, uh, and they'll play along as well. They know you're kind of halfway through, you're getting towards the end of the session. Uh, they'll, they'll avoid, they'll skip the other rooms, they'll rush straight to that sacrificial ceremonial chamber for the last event. Uh, the culmination of the adventure. And then, of course, the twist is that the ceremony can't go forward without the, the human sacrifice which the players so willingly deliver to the sound of the gong. An excellent ending. Um, so, uh, having a hook to bring on the ending. In this instance, our hook is the sound of the gong. Uh, the sound of the gong starts... Uh, the sound of the gong starts the ceremony. Full moon rising, an earthquake happening, a boat leaving, any of these can be a similar things. Uh, Salt Goodman says, the pillars of the house are being knocked out each hour. Find the treasure before you're buried alive. Ooh, that's a good one too. Yeah, it's a remind, it reminds them of the countdown. Like sometimes players uh, uh, forget to kind of check uh, the, 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 the time themselves. Often I find it's me as Dungeon Master who forgets to check the time. But um, 
Uh, the players forget to check the time, and so every hour there's a beep on your phone, and maybe you share what that beep means, or maybe you have it just on vibrate, and a pillar collapses, and the sections of the temple become crushed in rubble. If they're still in those sections, you can borrow from a board game in this uh, subterranean. The board game has sections of rubble collapsing. They need to move out of those sections. You're closing off rooms that are uh, you now know as Dungeon Master, you know are irrelevant to the plot, and they need to move, their party needs to move on towards the ending, or get so collapsed. And similarly, uh, we said I said um, have a hook to bring on the ending, have a hook to conclude it, have a countdown, have a timer. Literally at midnight, if we go over, the temple will collapse. The last pillar gives way, and it all comes tumbling down. Success or failure, you are crushed and buried alive in the temple uh, is another thing you can do. Uh, the, we talked earlier about how the players can take risks. The dungeon master can take risks in one shots, and one risk is to say midnight uh, comes success or victory at midnight. The final pillar collapses and the temple uh gives way to the trembling of the earthquake and you are all buried alive or buried dead as the case may be um so that's uh some of what i've done and brainstormed and thank you for help with the brainstorming as well uh on uh, on some of these suggestions of how to make one shots what one shots can do better uh and what can we do in one shots how do they work a little differently and how can we do them better um, since we're hitting the end of the stream, I like to take this opportunity. If there anyone has any, anyone who's attending has any other like, completely unrelated dungeon mastering questions or one shot dungeon mastering questions, I'm happy to, I'm happy to answer them and engage with those. Uh, any kind of qu dungeon master question at all, I don't mind. It could be simple rules questions or it could be, uh, gaming preference questions as well. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll take this moment to say that uh, um, do uh, do follow me on Twitter and YouTube at GM Ben. You can catch notifications of when I'm doing a show. Um, YouTube, I put up little excerpts of these shows. So if you've missed one, you'll catch a little little blurb or two. Um, on TikTok, likewise, and uh, Twitch. Not currently using my uh, Twitch at GM Ben Show, but if I launch a second show, that's where you're going to find out about it first. So follow me on there if you enjoy this content and watch to catch want to catch more of it live. Um, I'll give a moment more for any final questions, and I want to say to the dungeon masters out there, if you, uh, if you've not, uh, run a one-shot, I highly recommend it, and I think they're a great way to get to play with some new players, to play with some new rule sets, to play with some new plots, to do the types of plots that you can't do when everyone, uh, kind of expects that they'll survive to, to face another day. Um, I highly encourage it. Try them out. Uh, AO asks, what's your favorite one-shot that you've played or DM'd? That's a great question. Um, I, I can reference very rapidly two uh, one-shots that I've talked about on stream before. And incidentally, they're both kind of horror one-shots, and I've DM'd them, so uh, I guess I have a kind of a soft spot for horror one-shots. One is the False Hydra, which was a one-shot, but it involved ongoing... And it was an ongoing campaign, but it was a one-night adventure. Um, and I won't say any more about that because, uh, but if you have mentioned before on stream, do look that up for your dungeon master. Uh, but in case you're a player, I didn't want to spoil anything, but uh, that is a fun one to run. It's available. There's a, it's not a, it's not a published adventure. There's uh, content on a few blogs talking about how to run a uh, false Hydra. And, um, and another one shot is another one I teased, uh, last session talking about horror is one. It was a haunted dungeon where the twist was that the dungeon itself was possessed by a great spirit that could move the stonework and activate the traps and reset the traps and crush and swallow the players whole. And I pre-typed up a bunch of notes to pass the players throughout that entire one shot. And so I, uh, I teased the last stream that as, as the players were rolling what they thought were perception checks, they were actually rolling wisdom saving throws as I converted their modifiers to determine the end result. And they were slowly getting uh, haunted and possessed by ghosts that I was slipping them notes as I did this. Uh, that was a great one. Uh, unfortunately, lessons learned from that one. That one took two days to run. I only got halfway through before midnight and we said, you know what? Let's meet again. Let's meet it again in a few weeks and play the rest of this one shot. Lessons learned there. Um, and AO uh, has the final word here. I've, they've done some good one shots with dogs in the vineyard. Uh, yeah, that's a fun game as well. It lends itself well to one shots with its episodic structure, and it's also used the opportunity to push players to make really tough decisions. Yeah, by Vincent Baker, uh, I believe, is the author of Dogs of the Vineyard. It's a fun little um, kind of Western, Midwestern um, uh, uh, rule set that makes guns particularly dangerous. So uh, if guns get drawn, that may mean the end of your hero, which is uh, it does lend itself very well to one shots. 
Um, all right. Thank you all. Uh, thank you for joining me on this adventure. I stream Odd Sundays at 4 Eastern. Watch the schedule over on GoodmanGames.com as well as the social media for my next episode. And as always, have a good session. Thank you.